Well, you know, continuing in the, in the studies in Exodus, last week we were beginning to look at that 17th chapter, and we saw initially in the chapter, that the chapter breaks down into two parts. There's a first part from the first uh, seven verses, and then there's that second part, verses 8 through 16. And uh, we, we just began to get into the second part last week as we observed something happening here. It starts with these three words, then came Amalek. And that's what we'll be studying tonight. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, choose out men, go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun, and Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar, and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi. For he said, Because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Now, we looked at this. this as we've been reading through the book of Exodus, we have observed that the children of Israel have been oppressed by various oppressors, mostly Pharaoh and his minions, his taskmasters. And every time they were oppressed, the Lord would move in and battle on their behalf. At no point up until chapter 17 have we seen Israel have to lift a hand or any part of their body in defense of themselves. It was the Lord that would bring the plagues and the Lord that would sever and divide his people from those upon whom he was bringing his wrath and the plagues. And the Lord had been doing all the battle up until this time. And all of a sudden, in, Genesis, or in Exodus 17, verse 8, then came Amalek. Now as we looked at it and studied it through, we saw that Amalek is a type of the flesh. And we got that study by running back to Genesis uh, chapter 36. And we observed that Amalek was one of the descendants of Esau. And Esau, Edom, is the essential, uh, quintessential type of the flesh. There was Jacob, the spirit man, and Esau, the flesh man, who sold his birthright for red pottage. He had no interest in the things of God, no interest in spiritual things, no interest in heavenly things. He's earthly minded, fleshy minded, a carnal type of person. And we see Amalek is one of his descendants. So as I was thinking it through, here's my observation. We have known so far in our studies that the book of Exodus is the book of redemption and God is redeeming his people. He's purchasing his people back from the slavery and the bondage of sin. And God has delivered them through the Passover. And God has brought them across the Red Sea on dry land. And God has destroyed the Pharaoh. And God has given them the manna. And God, in this very chapter, has given them the water from the rock in Horeb. And we saw the typology. The typology being that the Passover lamb slain is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we saw that the water from the rock, according to Jesus' teaching, last week we saw this in John chapter 7, is a picture of the Holy Spirit. Out of thy belly shall flow rivers of living water. And it's a picture of the Holy Spirit being given to God's people. So, first we have the Lamb slain, and then we have the Holy Spirit given. The same chronology that occurs in the New Testament. You could not get the Holy Spirit until Calvary had occurred. And so Calvary had occurred, the Lamb was slain, and the Holy Spirit was poured out 50 days later at Pentecost. And so we have the same type of chronology occurring here. The Passover Lamb of the 12th chapter and the Holy Spirit of the 17th chapter. And it is at this point 
where God now allows his child to have a spiritual battle. They were not ready for spiritual battle before this. None of us were ready for spiritual battle until number one, we had received the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. And number two, we had have some time for the Holy Spirit to fill us. God does not send his children out into battle until they are ready, until they have grown a ways and grown a while and walk with the Lord a while and have the Holy Spirit. And so now we see then came Amalek. So as I saw it, Amalek and Esau, both being types of the flesh, but with a, a very slight difference between them. Esau represents the unsaved flesh. Amalek represents the flesh that battles the saved person. That's your flesh and mine. See, when you and I go out in the workplace and we're dealing with unsaved people, we're dealing with Esau's. The flesh that's going to battle you and me the most isn't the Esau's of the world, it's the Amalek of our own flesh. The Christian has three enemies, and we're going to study this. The enemies of the Christian are the world, that's the Esau's out there, the flesh, that's your own flesh, and the devil, that's a spiritual adversary you have. And those are the three enemies of the Christian. The world is outer. The flesh is unfortunately something you carry around with you. And the devil is something that gets in your mind. But the flesh, the Amalek, that's your flesh. And this is the picture. Then came Amalek. When does your flesh rise up and fight against you? As soon as the Holy Spirit fills you and your flesh recognizes, hey, I was in charge around here for all these years. I was calling the shots. This guy was living according to the lusts of the flesh. Is there any other way for an unsaved person to live? Did not you and I live according to the lusts of the flesh before salvation? Are we not sometimes tempted, even now, to go back to living in the lusts of the flesh? That's Amalek. And Amalek comes along when he finds out he has been knocked off the throne by the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit takes over, then Amalek comes to do battle. Then came Amalek. Amalek is a picture of the flesh. Let me turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. Peter was a man that understood this. Peter received the new birth. And Jesus told him one night, he said, Simon, when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. You see, when Peter was walking with Jesus, before Jesus went to Calvary's cross, Peter could not have the filling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit could not reside in anyone before Jesus Christ was glorified. And we're going to do a study in the very near future. I'm going to start a series on dispensational truth with you. And I'm going to take you through the dispensations. You are so blessed. We are so blessed that we live in the age of grace, the dispensation whereby the Holy Spirit resides inside of us. When we are imparted with the gift of the Holy Spirit. When Peter walked with Jesus, he could not have that gift. And Jesus told him, he said, when thou art converted, when the full conversion occurs, Peter, after my death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, when thou art converted and the Holy Spirit's in you, he didn't say all that, but that's what he was meaning, then you can strengthen your brethren because you'll be strong with the Holy Spirit. You can say, now, now Peter's converted when he writes this epistle here. Where are you? Are you with me in uh, 1 Peter? Mm -hmm. In this particular chapter, uh, this epistle entirely, Peter is talking about the great gift of salvation, uh, chapter 1, verse 23, being born again. And then in chapter 2, he talks about, verse 2, As a newborn babe desireth the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. I mean, he wants us to grow in the faith. Uh, verse 3, If you have so tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming you came to the Lord, as unto a living stone, oh, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Isn't that why we came to Jesus Christ? The world may reject him, but we finally saw he was God's elect. He's God's anointed. 
He's the Christ of God, precious. And then we came to Jesus Christ, verse 5, then ye also as lively stones, now you're alive with the Spirit, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Christ Jesus. Nothing you and I do apart from Jesus Christ is acceptable to God. All the religions in the world that are laboring out there, and I don't know what name they're laboring in, nothing they do is acceptable to God. God does not accept anything that's apart from the working in the name of His Son. And, and he says, verse 9, Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now he talks about which in time past, before you were saved, you were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy before in times past, but now have obtained mercy. The difference between before conversion and after conversion. The difference between before the lamb was slain and before the water from the rock at Horeb been poured in you to after you receiving the lamb and receiving the water from the rock at Horeb. So now he says in this verse 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you, as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshy lusts which war against the soul. Amalek, the lusts of the flesh inside you are going to war against your soul now that you've been converted, now that you've received the lamb, now that you've received the water from the rock, look out, then comes Amalek. The fleshy lusts are going to war against your soul. And that's the picture you're getting here in the 17th chapter of Exodus. Now, I've got this battle going on. How are you and I to fight this battle? You know the key to victory in battle, if you've been in the army, and I haven't, but I've read books and I've read stories about men who fought. The key to victory in battle is to know yourself and to know your opponent. To know your strengths and then try and get good intelligence as to how your opponent is going to come against you. This book will help you know yourself and know your opponent. Amen. And this book will give you a battle plan and a strategy that, thanks be to God, will give us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, in this book, it's painting a portrait for us of Amalek, our flesh, rising up, the lusts of our flesh, warring against our soul, our converted soul. So notice how he's going to do this. There's going to be two ways this battle is going to be fought as we go back to uh, Exodus chapter 17. The portrait will be painted. If we follow the way God portrays it here in the scriptures, we can have victory. If we follow another battle plan, don't be surprised if you lose. You know why? Think about this. How many folks have you known, maybe even including yourself before salvation, had a problem in your life that you couldn't seem to lick? You may even made New Year's resolutions about it. And say, you know, this year it's going to be different. This year I'm going to beat this thing. And it isn't much before February 1st rolls around. Okay, well maybe next year we'll look at another resolution. That one's gone. Because the, the battle against the flesh can't be worn, won by our imagination or by our battle plans. This is a battle that's going to require divine intervention and divine help. Now watch how it's going to be done. When Amalek comes to fight in verse 8, here's what happens. Moses said unto Joshua, there's going to be two people involved in this battle here. We're going to have Joshua... And we're going to have Moses. They're both going to be involved in the battle in slightly different ways. We're going to find out that Joshua's point, his, his, what he's given, his uh, plan, is this. The tactic to use, Joshua, verse 9, choose out men and go out, fight with Amalek. So Joshua is sent forth as the warrior. 
Joshua is sent out as the fighter. Okay, Moses, what are you going to do? Okay, he says, I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. It reminds me of that old show that used to be on uh, Mutual of Omaha, Wild Kingdom. <laughs> but it's a little, little different. But they used to have two guys, and one guy did all the dirty work, and the other guy was always on the top with the camera. You know, <laughs> this is a little different. I'm sorry, but I have fun with the scriptures. Don't take this personally, Lord. I'm just having a good time thinking about it. But, but there's going to be a bit going on here. But it's a little bit different, but you see how the world imitates these things. I, I, I always think about that. We're safely up here. <laughs> While my friend Jim is down there in that valley trying to give an enema to that alligator. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's just, just a strange thing. But anyways, the, the way it's going to work is one's going to be involved in the battle and Moses himself is going to be up here on the top of the hill as the intercessor. There's going to be a battler there's going to be an intercessor. Now, as I was thinking about their ages, too, Joshua was younger than Moses at this particular time. And as I thought about it, I was reading through 1 John, and, you, and you've probably read this passage yourself in 1 John chapter 2, where he talks about the, the growth phases of a Christian. He talks about the young children, little children. Then he talks about the young men. And then he talks about the fathers. And this is kind of the progressive growth that a Christian I say ought to go through. Mm -hmm. Sadly, my observation being a Christian for many years now is most are arrested, not even adolescents, they're arrested kindergartners in Christianity today. I don't think it's entirely their fault. I think they have bad teachers. I don't think they're properly fed the right word of God and it's hard for a child to grow if he's given bad nutrition. A lot of Christians are arrested at the little children stage. But if they're fed properly, if the shepherd feeds them the way Jesus said in John chapter 21, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, they'll grow into young men's sheep. Feed my sheep, they'll even grow into father's sheep. They'll grow all the way across the progression, but keep feeding them the word of God, every word of God being pure. There's a growth process that will occur. And in the battle, what you see is Joshua represents the young man. And Moses represents the father, or fathers. And these would be the young men, if you will. As a matter of fact, just to show, turn to 1 John chapter 2. And I'll just, again, we'll look at the progression and watch how it lines up. 1 John chapter 2, verse 12. A comforting Verse, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. A, a, a little Christian, a, a new Christian needs to know your sins are forgiven for Jesus' name's sake. Not anything you did. It's for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ and his name. That's why you have forgiveness. Rest in that. Fret not about your salvation. You cannot lose your salvation. You did not earn it. Your sins were not forgiven for anything you did. Your sins were forgiven for his name's sake. Rest in that. Okay, then, then he progresses. He says, I write unto you fathers, verse 13, because you've known him that's from the beginning. I write unto you young men because ye have overcome the wicked one. Verse 14, I write unto you fathers because you have known him that is uh, uh, from the beginning. Watch this. I have written unto you young men because ye are strong and the word of God abideth in you and ye have overcome the wicked one. Now notice that the young man, it seems like he's involved in battle. He's overcoming. He's fighting. But it doesn't sound that like a father. Now, now here's what happens. You're going to go through the growth process of being a young man and progress to a father. Here's what's happening. What's happening here is in some of these battles, you're going to encounter a lot of them when you're in the young man phase. When you get to the father type phase, you're going to be praying for other people going through that battle. Because hopefully God's taking you through those battles now and you've learned to be like Paul and to keep your body under. There's a point where you finally are able to subject the body and the flesh and you overcome it with the spirit inside of you. Moses has gotten to that point. He's not fighting that battle. He's praying for someone that is fighting that battle. 
So as a church family, where does that put us? Well, this is why the Lord puts us together, two, three together, why he gives us brothers in the Lord, why he does, hopefully with each one of you, like he did with the apostle of Paul and Timothy. When you look at Paul, Paul had a friend, Barnabas. Paul had someone under him, Timothy. And Timothy had someone over him, a Paul. The point being this, your full relationship in the Lord, you should have someone that's older than you in the Lord, that's like a Paul to you and you're like a Timothy. You should have someone that's a brother to you in the Lord, like a Paul and a Barnabas. And someday you go to the point where you have younger ones under you that you're bringing up in the Lord and you're discipling like Paul discipled Timothy. And you should have that threefold fullness. This is where you'll find it in the church house. In the church house, you're liable to find your Barnabas. In the church house, you're liable to find your Paul. And in the church house, you may find your Timothy. And this would be the Paul, this would be the Timothy. And if you're young and you're the Timothy, then your Paul's going to be praying for you while you're battling that battle. And if you're older and you're the Paul, you're going to be praying for your Timothy. And maybe both Paul and Barnabas have some of their own battles and they pray one for another. This is the picture. These battles are hard to be won alone. The Lord does not really want a lone wolf Christian. He wants to bring him in. When we see these battles fought, you're going to see the Lord's people working together. Someone's actively in the battle, warring, fighting. Someone's actively in the battle, praying. When I got the call this week from uh, South America, and I was told about some of the things going on down there, you know, what could I do? I could intercede in prayer. I couldn't actually get down to the battle. Couldn't make it to South America. Had to go to work the next day. Had a 730 case. But I could get on the hill of God by my bedside and pray right there. You and I can be helpers together through prayer, interceding for others. This is a picture being painted for us right now. Now this is the first time that Joshua is mentioned in the Holy Bible, and the first time we see him is one going out in battle. Now, I showed you a spiritual interpretation here. This would be the spiritual interpretation. Practically, how it would work in our life. From a doctrinal standpoint, if you want to look at the doctrinal interpretation, Joshua, turn to Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. Verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give to the children of Israel, of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, every one a ruler among them. And then when you get on down there, it'll tell you the names of all these people, the one person pulled out of every tribe, and 12 people are sent to search out the land. And when you get to verse 8, you see, of the tribe of Ephraim, Oshea, the son of Nun. Now this is the tribe of Ephraim. Ephraim means fruitfulness. And this is the 8th verse. And you skip down to the 16th verse, and it says, And these are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Oshea, that's the one back from verse 8, he's the one of Ephraim, Oshea, he called Oshea, the son of Nun, he called him Jehoshua. Jehoshua. Now, Jehoshua means Jehovah is salvation. Look unto me, all ye ends of the earth, and be ye saved. I am the Lord, and there is no other Savior. And so, Joshua is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
doctrinally, Joshua equals Jesus. So, when you look at the battle that goes on, you notice Joshua did not show up in Scripture until the rock had been smitten. And the first thing he does is he goes out to fight with the sword. Verse 13, take your sword, back where we were in Exodus, it's, so, verse 13 tells us the sword that he went out with. Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. The Lord Jesus Christ, when you and I are in a battle with our flesh, it is not you and I that will win the battle. It will be Jesus Christ living in you and living in me that's going to win the battle with our flesh. The reason I couldn't keep a New Year's resolution about my flesh before I was saved was well, I had no desire to, first off, but I didn't have the ability. The spirit may have been willing, but my flesh is weak <laughs> in trying to fight itself, <laughs> and it gives up. But Jesus is mighty. <laughs> to the pulling down of imaginations and strongholds, and he can win any battle. And so then once I got saved, I had Joshua, salvation. I had Jesus now taking the battle against my flesh. And Jesus can win that battle. There's no doubt about it. And, he, and the way he did it, he discomfited Amalek with the sword. With the sword. Now turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Although it is a, a battle, my flesh that I'm trying to get under control, your flesh that you're trying to get under control, the lusts of the flesh that we're trying to get under control... Remember, we are primarily spiritual creatures. And what's going on inside is a battle inside, a spiritual battle, as to whether or not the Spirit of Christ can overcome the spirit of our flesh. There's a spiritual battle going on inside, trying to wrestle the flesh under control. So, when we are in battle, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord... And in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand. And in this particular battle, it's against the wiles of the devil. But when it's the battle against the flesh too, I need God's armor. Because the thing I'm going to need eventually is, verse 17, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The sword of the Spirit is the word of God. The word of God is quick and powerful sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder the joints and the marrow and the soul and the spirit. The sword of the spirit is able to pierce in and do that battle and win and discomfit Amalek inside of you or me as long as we allow Jesus to do it. We really have to allow Christ to do the battle. When we try to get in the battle with him, we mess him up. We we'll talk about let go and let God. When it comes to the battle with the flesh, you really need to let Jesus win that battle. You have to pray with intercessory prayer and supplication that, Lord, this battle I'm having, I want you to win this battle. I'm relying on you to win this. I'm not trusting in myself to win. I can't win this battle. You have to, in humility... Admit the fact, I can't win this. Now, you know what the world wants you to do? You can do anything. It's in you. You can beat this. You're capable of doing this. You the man. That's the world. That's the wrong spirit. It's humility. In, in, in your weakness, his strength is made perfect. It's realizing, I can't beat Amalek, Lord. I need Joshua to go out and win that battle for me. And relying on Jesus. And, and it's the word of God that's going to first alert you to which battle of the flesh you're in. 
and the Word of God that's going to strengthen you in prayer and the Word of God that's going to remind you Jesus is going to win it and not me. And it's going to put to rest any of those little voices that come in your mind through uh, magazines, uh, TV commercials, friends at the office giving you ideas as to how to fight it. You want the Word of God. You want not be conformed to the world, but transformed. Have your mind renewed with the sword of the Spirit and the Word of God so that Joshua can fight the battle for you. Now he discomfits the flesh. Now I noticed carefully, he said he discomfited Amalek. He did not eliminate it. He discomfited. In other words, in this particular battle, he overcame it, subdued it, put it aside for this battle. But didn't eliminate it or kill it or get rid of it. Why? Because as long as you and I are pilgrims and strangers down here, we're going to have those fleshy lusts warring against our soul. And we will find ourselves going from battle to battle. This is not the first time Amalek's going to show up in our life. And not the last. And Amalek's going to show up all through the Old Testament, battling the children of Israel. And that's why it is written, the Lord said unto Moses, verse 14, write this for a memorial, okay? In verse, in verse 16, the Lord hath sworn the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Every generation of new Christians that come up is going to face Amalek. And you're going to have it from generation to generation. Now, thankfully, the memorial we have in verse 16 is the Lord hath sworn that not I will have war with Amalek, but the Lord himself will have war with Amalek. Joshua is willing to fight the battle for you if you let him. If you let him. I think the problem with us so often is that, you know, we want to help out in the battle. You know, I, I don't know if I can give a good illustration. I'm just thinking from my own life. Um, not that being in the operating room is a battle, but, but sometimes there is a battle to try and get a very important thing under control so a patient might live. For example, we had one recently occurring where we had to get this patient's airway under control. If we didn't get the airway under control, there's this uh, brutal response that occurs in the airway. The Lord put it in there as a protective measure but sometimes when it goes overboard, and it can in critical situations, the airway will shut down in an attempt to let nothing bad get in, but also it lets no oxygen get in. And when no oxygen gets in, the patients can die. No matter how many IVs are in them, they need oxygen to sustain them. And so we're trying to get this, this uh, airway under control. And yours truly was in the battle. And I'm praying, of course. And I'm working on it, and I had a very young medical student want to help me. And I underappreciated that their desire to want to help. But, but in a critical situation, it would be like maybe driving a car in a tight situation and then having a 16-year-old that just got their learner's permit saying, hey, I'd like to help out in this situation. <laughs> it doesn't really help when someone else takes the wheel in a critical time. It doesn't help when there's a second driver. You understand what I'm saying? So I appreciate the medical student wanted to help, but this was not the time, all right? Stand back and watch and pray for me while we get this under control. I don't need your hands in there. I think Jesus feels that with us a lot when he's trying to work a particular battle and discomfort Amalek, and we're saying, hey, can I get in there and get a hand on this? We make it a little more difficult for him. Just some thoughts. Now, um... Let me show you the one other thing in terms of the intercessory prayer. At the same time Joshua was in the battle, Moses is up on the hill and he's praying. Now observe what happened to Moses. He says, verse 9, I will stand on the top, end of verse, I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. Now I think, I think historically it went like this. Okay, Joshua, young man has a bunch of young, strong, able-bodied men, Brother Dave, a bunch of young guys uh, going out there. And, and, uh, and Moses and the older guys are going up, they're going to pray. And they say, you know, when you look back at us, you know we're still praying because we're going to hold up the rod. You'll be able to look back and know, and there's the rod being lifted up high. I mean, this is the rod that the Lord used for all those plagues in Egypt. This is the rod that separated the Red Sea. This is the rod that represents all the promises of God and how he's kept them. This is the word of God. 
This is the rod. And, and you know what? When I have someone do an intercessory prayer for me, I want them praying according to the will of God, according to the Word of God. I don't want someone praying some vain repetition of the heathen. I don't want someone praying some goofy Christian theology that came up from, you know, somebody had a vision in a dream one day, and the televangelist on TV said that the, I want someone praying with the Word of God. In other words, when I'm picking out my prayer warrior, my intercessor, my Moses, I want to make sure it's someone that's familiar with the Word of God. And every time I talk to him, I'm getting an assurance that he's lifting up the Word of God on my behalf and not some goofy notions. That's one good thing when you're picking someone. I mean, when I need prayer, there's a few people I'll call. And the folks that I call, I know are in that book. And I don't waste my time asking for other people's prayers. <laughs> They're not holding the rod of God up. This is the antenna that gives you the best connection. And so I want a Moses that's holding up the rod of God. So, so when they look back, they say, wow, he's got the promises of God in his hand. And that encouraged Joshua and the men when they were in the battle. But I'll tell you what happened to Moses. Verse 11. It came to pass when, when he held up his hand that Israel prevailed. When he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. When we stop praying according to the word of God, don't be surprised if the flesh wins the battle. That's why, you know, we spend time here, we study the scriptures carefully, and we're going to go through this study with you. I want to show you the difference between the world and the flesh and the devil. They all attack three different ways, and you need a particular defense for each one. Okay? Football analogy. All right? You're on the, the one yard line and you want to go in for the touchdown. Okay? If I'm on defense, I'm not going to put a nickel back in in a prevent. I'm going to load it up with the goal line stance. Okay? When you're on the one yard line and your flesh wants to push across and win, you need the goal line stand to scripture. Of course, when the devil's battling you, it's different. He wants one of those long pass touchdowns. That's not the time for the goal line defense. That's the time to have the nickel backs, the safeties, a two deep zone, coverage over the top. The Word of God will show you which defense to be using depending on who's attacking you. And if we don't hold up the Word of God, Amalek's going to prevail. Amalek's going to prevail. But this happens, verse 12. Even using the Word of God, verse 12, Moses' hands were heavy. Even using the Word of God, Moses' hands were heavy. The, the truth of the matter is that prayer is hard. It's labor. Of my Christian walk, it's like the most difficult thing I do. It's to stay in serious prayer. Now, I thank the Lord. Now, now my, my strength is the Word of God. I'm weaker when it comes to prayer. I know some other brothers that are strong in prayer and not as strong in the Word of God. But they get at the Word of God. And so, so, I mean, we all have our different strengths. But I know that prayer is hard. And, and your hands get heavy in prayer. And you start to fall a little in prayer. I've had times where I've kind of fallen asleep in prayer at the bedside. And I got to wake myself up and start the prayer again. And my hands are getting heavy in prayer. And I start to fall asleep. And then I got to rouse myself up. And I got to, Lord, and press through and pray. These are realities. And Moses is showing this here. He's getting heavy. So, so what happens? They took a stone. They put it under him. It's okay to sit down when you pray. You don't always have to kneel. Showing you right there. It's okay to sit and pray. We did an all-night prayer uh, meeting once. And um, we had chairs. It was one o'clock in the morning. We sat down. We had the prayer requests with the chairs. We, we you know, sitting on the chair, praying. I mean, my knees would have given out. It's okay, the Lord, look, look, the Lord is a spirit. We worship him in spirit and truth. We communicate with him spiritually. He's not upset if you sit down and pray. But another thing I observe here too, Aaron and her stayed up his hands, the one on the one side, and the other on the other side until his hands were steady, until the going down of the sun. They're having an all-night 
prayer session here, or an all-day prayer session. And he wasn't doing it alone. He had prayer partners. That's what we did when we had this prayer meeting. We were sharing the prayer requests. Brother so-and-so would pray for a while. He would get tired. I would take a few requests. I would pray for a while. Brother so-and-so would pray for a while. We stayed up each other's hands. We held the, helped each other in prayer. That's good. Again, this is the body of Christ coming together. Again, typology being shown forth here. First off, if, if you were to follow, you've got Aaron and her. Now, do you know what tribe Aaron is from? It's from the tribe of Levi. That's correct. Levi is the priestly tribe. Do you know what tribe her is from? First Chronicles chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. He's from the tribe of Judah. So we've got the priestly tribe and the kingly tribe. Again, doctrinally, it's a picture of when prayer is going on, what you have is you have Aaron, the high priest, Jesus, the high priest, helping you in prayer, and you have her, which stands for light, which stands for the oil lamp in the tabernacle. The lamps were lit by oil. It's the Holy Spirit. When you and I pray, even though Jesus is fighting the battle, Jesus is right by us in the prayer. The Holy Spirit is right with us in prayer. They're working together. Romans chapter 8. Turn to Romans chapter 8. I mean, an x-ray of what's going on when you and I pray. Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. My hands are getting weak in prayer. The Holy Spirit comes in to lift up one hand. For we know not what we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts, that's verse 34, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Jesus making intercession. When you and I are in prayer, the Holy Spirit and Jesus are working with us, holding us up to make sure that our prayers are effectual and fervent and the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much again got to be righteous you got to have the righteousness of Jesus Christ but then you've got that effectual fervency of of Aaron and her holding you up in the prayer sometimes I think that is who wakes me up at the bedside it's the Holy Spirit Mike we're not done with that prayer oh right right <laughs> okay, let me get that going again. Okay, well, we're praying for a brother. Yeah, that's right. And <laughs> Folks, we're just people, you know. I'm not a super saint. I'm just a simple saint walking with the Lord. But that's the portrait that wants to be painted for us right here. Now, we end the chapter seeing this. Joshua won the battle. Praise God. Jesus giveth us the victory. Thanks be to God. And the Lord said unto Moses, write this for a memorial in a book. Write it so people know they're going to face this battle in their life. These things are written for our edification. They're written for our learning. They're written for our example. They're written for our comfort. Write it for a memorial. And rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. Going back to spiritual. Tell the young men Tell a young Christian he's going to face this. And tell him, if he goes out and faces the adversary with the sword of the Spirit and the power of the Lord, he'll win the battle. He'll discomfit Amalek. Write it. Verse, end of verse 14. For I will utterly, I, the Lord, will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. You know, God doesn't want to remember our flesh. He wants to think of us as his children, born with the seed of his son that cannot sin. What a blessing. That's how he sees us. God sees us through spiritual eyes. He sees us as sinlessly perfect. What a blessing. That's the Lord writing it out. Now you and I see it. And you and I battle with it. And you and I have to approach the battle the right way. Then watch what Moses does. And Moses built an altar. And he called the name of it Jehovah Nissi. Now, this is the second time we see a compound name of Jehovah in the Scriptures. 
The first time we saw it way back in Genesis chapter 22, when we saw Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide himself a lamb for a sacrifice. What a blessing. That's where it all starts. But now we're seeing Jehovah Nissi. Jehovah Nissi means the Lord, our banner. You see, he was standing up there, holding up the rod of God. That was the banner that they would look back to and be encouraged as they saw that banner, the banner of the Lord, the banner of the promises of the Lord that have been spoken and God hath not failed one word of his good promise. And that's what encouraged them. That was the banner they looked toward. This is the banner that we hold up for the Lord. And as we look at that banner, and on one side that banner shows Amalek, he's in a lot of trouble because the Lord's going to beat him. The Lord's going to discomfit him. The Lord's going to put out his remembrance. The Lord is going to have a war against Amalek from generation to generation. That's what Amalek sees on the banner. But in the Song of Solomon, a little tiny book, the last book that Solomon wrote after the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and the Song of Solomon, chapter 2. We see... This is the love relationship going on between the Lord. Verse 1, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. And the Lord starts the chapter and then later on the, 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 the bride says, verse 3, As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. Oh, Jesus is better than any of those trees that don't bear fruit. He has the precious fruit. Verse 4, He brought me to the banqueting house and his banner over me was love. And that's, that's something you can make an altar to, is the love of God. It's sweeter than any pen can ever write. It's deeper than any ocean still. And that's the banner that we look toward. Now that the Lord has provided the Lamb, we look up and we see Jehovah Nissi. We see the banner over us as one of love. You know why the Lord wants to win these battles? Because He loves us. Because He knows what's in our best interest. And He knows that He that is the servant of sin is a slave. But, if you continue in my word, the rod of God, then are you my disciples indeed. And, you shall know the Son, and the Son shall make you free. And his love will set us free from the very things that plagued us before our conversion. Those things that war against our soul. He'll free us from those burdens. Jehovah Nissi, the Lord, our banner, the banner over us is love. Great picture portrayed for us. You know, uh, we have a few minutes. I was going through and we did the study on the names of God. And the word Jehovah is found in the authorized version four times. And the compound words of Jehovah are found three. Three plus four. Seven. Perfection. There's Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. There's Jehovah Nissi, that's the Lord our banner. And when you get to the book of jo Judges, you'll see Jehovah Shalom, that's the Lord our peace. And that's the perfection we have in our Lord in the New Testament, whose name is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, the name above all names. Any questions? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the portrait of Joshua fighting the battles on our behalf. Lord, and thank you that we see that sometimes we're in those battles personally, and Jesus is fighting on our behalf. Lord, sometimes we're praying and interceding for others, and at those times, Jesus is holding up our hands along with the Holy Spirit. Lord, help us always to lift up the rod of God, remembering the Word of God and the promises. And Lord, keep in our eyes and in our hearts that banner of love that you've put before us so that the love of Christ 
would constrain us in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.